Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second webinar of the European Schoolnet Academy Thematic Seminar on the topic of effective use of data in teacher training. My name is Benjamin Hertz. Um, I'm a pedagogical manager at uh, European Schoolnet, where I'm in charge of the teacher training program of the European Schoolnet Academy. Um, hopefully, uh, most of you have managed to join us also yesterday for the first webinar of this thematic seminar. Um, where we had a keynote presentation from Professor Hendrik Draxler about learning analytics in teacher training. Um, for this second webinar, um, we pick up some of those elements uh, raised by Professor Draxler yesterday, but the focus is really on hearing the voices of um, uh, four different cases where uh, in teacher training contexts, uh, data has been put to use or there has been a focus on uh, training teachers on, on learning analytics. So it's a great pleasure to have three guest speakers here today who will be introducing in detail in a moment, but just very briefly to say we have uh, Madeleine Murray here from Professional Development Service for Teachers in Ireland. We have uh, Honor Karadimir from the Leibniz Institute for International Educational Research uh, and Study Corps here. And then we have as a third guest speaker, Rui Pacheco um, from Porto Editora, a publisher in Portugal with us. Um, during the webinar today, we will hear from each of uh, these three guest speakers, uh, short input presentations on their experiences. Uh, and I myself also will give a short input presentation um, sharing some of our experience at the level of the European School Net Academy. Uh, before we get started, um, just a couple of housekeeping points, um, same as yesterday. So this meeting is being recorded and it might be used, the recording might be used for dissemination purposes. So please be aware of that. A second point, as you have probably noticed, um, you do not have microphone or uh, camera rights at the moment. Um, however, when we come to the Q&A sessions um, uh, after each of the presentations, then it's always nice to hear from people. So please raise your hand. Um, you should see a little hand icon at the top of the Teams window um, where you can raise your hand, virtually raise your hand, and uh, I will then give you microphone and camera rights so you can directly uh, ask your question or make a comment to the speaker. Um, <clears throat> yes, in the meantime, of course, during the presentations or generally at any point in time, do make use of the chat, um, do share any comments or questions there. And um, yeah, we will make sure to answer those or relay those to the uh, speakers um, at the given time, at the given moment. Okay, um, so just a quick um, Reminder here of these two key questions which we aim to answer um, in this seminar today. Um, the first, uh, looking at how teachers, how teacher trainers can support teachers to make effective use of data to support their work in the classroom. Um, and the second, how can teacher trainers make effective use of data to improve their teacher training offer? Of course, both of these are related. If we as teacher trainers um, can make effective use of data to improve our own offer, we are at the same time modeling to the teachers effective use of data for use in the classroom. So um, yeah, uh, these two questions were already addressed. Um, by Professor Draxler yesterday and today we will continue looking at these questions. Each of the presentations will focus probably more on one than the other, but hopefully uh, after the four presentations um, we have some useful input for each of these questions. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, as mentioned, um, we will have these uh, four input presentations. We'll start out with uh, Madeleine Murray, um, exploring how data is being used in the teacher training activities of the Professional Development Service uh, for Teachers in Ireland. Um, we'll then have Honor Academia talk to us about um, a concrete scenario of training teachers on the use of learning analytics in the classroom, followed by Ruth Pacheco sharing um, the practices uh, of the uh, educational public about using learning analytics to enhance teacher training processes. And I'll conclude then with a presentation about using data for personalized support in teacher training MOOCs, sharing some insights from a project we, we ran uh, a few years back on the European Schoolnet Academy. So um, 
without further ado, I would like to uh, pass the floor to Madeleine Murray. Uh, Madeleine is National Coordinator um, at the Professional Development Service for Teachers Technology in Ireland, uh, Technology and Education in Ireland, uh, where she's responsible for the design of the online continuous professional development courses uh, in the area of digital learning. And Madeleine also is a language graduate of Trinity College with a postgraduate diploma in primary teaching. So Madeleine, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Um, look forward to hearing more from you about this uh, topic. Um, yes, and I just need to jump over to your slides. So just give me a second. Slides should be coming up, so you'll have to request control again. OK, great. OK. Close great. Uh, thank you, Ben, and thank you for the introduction. And and thanks also for the opportunity to participate here. And I really enjoyed yesterday's session with uh, Professor Drexler. And uh, I, I was actually thinking about my slides. And I was thinking, God, I have lots of new ideas now. But anyway, um, for today, it's, uh, you know, I suppose it's an opportunity. Ben asked me to share some, exa you know, some examples of how we use data in our teacher training activities. So I'm delighted to be here today. Um, as Ben says, I am National Coordinator for CPD Design specific to digital learning. So it's um, all around the, the use of digital technologies in schools and our remit is primary and secondary. So first and second level schools in Ireland. So what we do, um, we're the we're the government agency, so we work on behalf of the Department of Education um, and we're responsible for promoting and supporting digital learning in schools. We have um, a range of online and face to face courses that we provide, and, and I suppose that will be the focus of, of um, the information today. We also though, provide in school support. We um, develop videos of teachers using technology, which we share on our website. Um, we manage the school's Internet Safety Initiative, WebWise, the school's educational portal, Skullnet. Um, we also provide digital learning planning support and infrastructure support to schools. Um, I suppose important to say as well that our work is underpinned by two key documents, and one of them is our new digital strategy for schools to 2027. And the other one is our digital learning framework for primary schools and post primary schools. So all of our work supports those uh, two key strategy uh, documents. OK, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, um, uh, you know, how we use data in our online courses on digital learning. And it's just this is just to give you an idea of the types of courses that we have. We have a very popular course on developing a digital learning plan and um, we've courses on digital citizenship, cyberbullying um, using multimedia for climate change. Digital, digital portfolios are hugely popular in Ireland um, at primary and post primary level. So we do a lot of work in that area. Um, and then digital storytelling and assessment. And we were delighted uh, to be shortlisted for an award for our digital citizenship education course. Um, and that, you know, that, that's just a, a recent development. So we were delighted to hear that. So um, in relation to then this specific example that I wanted to talk about today, we, we run a program of online summer courses in digital learning for primary teachers and, and primary principals. These are um, particular courses that they're, they're approved by the Department of Education. They must have 20 hours of learning um, and, and they must. They, that's very, very important because teachers actually have an incentive to do these courses. They will get additional uh, hours of leave from school, but they but it must have 20 hours of learning. It must have lessons, assignments, discussion forums. So they're very strict in terms of the criteria for these online courses and they must be moderated by e-tutors who are also uh, primary teachers or, or principals. So these courses um, would provide us with, I suppose, what we would say an opportunity and also a challenge. The opportunity being because there is an incentive for completion, we get really high numbers. So we would train two, two thousand or three, you know, between two and three thousand teachers every summer on these courses, which is very high um, relative to our overall numbers. So we um, 
you know, because of this captive audience, we use it as a platform to promote key messages around digital learning, planning and um, effective embedding of digital technologies in classroom teaching. So they're, they're a really important um, vehicle for us to promote uh, digital learning in schools. They do present a challenge. So apart from the fact that because they have to all be moderated, there is a there's a resourcing challenge, obviously. But in terms of, um, you know, the 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 actually act the application of learning, we would find that because the courses take take place in summer, that there is a challenge in trying to get teachers to actually apply their learning when they return to school. So, for example, some teachers might do this course in July and won't be back in their classroom till the 1st of September. So there can be a gap. So that is something that we really focus on in our design and um, in terms of our data as well, that we're really trying to narrow that gap and make it much easier for teachers to transfer their learning to um, to practice. So I suppose where does where does data fit in? This would be typically our, our planning cycle and we would apply this to, to many areas of our work that we would plan courses, we would design them, we deliver, we would gather data and we would review the data. And I suppose recently as well, we've kind of we've updated this because actually while we're delivering courses, we're also gathering data and we're using that data. So um, so it's not just a case of that we would wait till the end of the course to to evaluate it. We, we're continually trying to assess um, participation in, in our online courses. Um, we would apply this cycle both to new courses and then we also um, would apply it for updating courses as well. So most of our courses would have a two to three year life cycle, but we are continually reviewing them and um, continually using data to improve them. So in terms of what we gather and um, the data that we gather, so I mean, I suppose the most straightforward is the end of course questionnaire, and I hope you can read that, that the writing is very small. Um, so the end of course questionnaire is the, you know, did the course achieve state of learning objectives, the quality of content instruction, et cetera? And then course completion, what we would look at there is the percentage of teachers that have met the requirements for the, the 20 hour summer course. This this is generally very high. And again, it's it, it, that is generally linked to the um, the fact that there is an incentive for completion. Then what do we we gather in course? And this is mainly assessed by our e-tutor um, you know, that would be assigned to different groups. We would have in course assignments. So we have, um, you know, typically our courses will involve at the bare minimum creating a lesson outline for their own class um, or they may be adapting a lesson. They may be engaging in quizzes or creating resources and our, our e-tutors typically assess that. Then we would have a reflective learning assignment, which is, you know, reflecting on the course and how they'll apply aspects of it in their own classroom. We also have a learning record which we ask teachers to compile, and this is something that they might share with colleagues and they might, you know, share it as part of a staff meeting or, or informally. And then in most of our courses, we ask teachers to create an, a, an action plan for digital learning. So all of these are, are assessed by the e-tutor. And then the follow on um, data, what we do is we run a, a survey approximately eight weeks after teachers have returned to the classroom and we ask them about their implementation of their learning in, in their classroom. We also invite them to participate in a course and they um, they share examples of, of what they've done in the classroom. And this has been, I suppose, an element of our work that we, we have found very beneficial because it gives us some some um, real data around how teachers are actually applying concepts in their classrooms. So how do we use the, the data? So first of all, the questionnaires, the content um, that what we get from the questionnaires would really feed into um, all of our designs, our updates. Um, for example, you know, we may get feedback on on even e-tutor engagement and things like that. So that might feed into our e-tutor training programs. We also look at things like timing where, you know, 20 hours of learning is a very subjective um, figure, you know, when you're talking about online learning. So we were continually trying to review that and balance the, the timings so that we get that right. And um, we'll also look at other areas of need. We'll ask teachers what else they need help with. Um, and, and that feeds into our planning processes so that and that's 
the traditional questionnaire where we, you know, we have always had that and we have always acted on on that information. So then um, something we've looked at a little bit more closely in recent times would be course completion. So identifying patterns of, uh, you know, and any locations of dropout um, and adjusting content. So, for example, we were finding that in our first module, so our courses typically it would have five modules and in our first module there was a high dropout rate. And what we have tried to do is make our first module a little bit easier uh, to promote more engagement. At, at module one and then, you know, we've tried to balance out the content. So actually, once we get them past module one, they're much more likely to stick with us. So that's something we're continually looking at um, and it, it provides some some useful data to us. And then what we do in, you know, while the course is live and I suppose this is something as well that I, I feel we we really need to look at how we can automate this and 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 um, and that's why, you know, I, I was so interested in in um, the presentation yesterday, because, you know, there are there are ways I think that we we can make this a little bit easier for ourselves. At the moment, how we do this is our each users feedback to our design and delivery personnel. So we have an online area in Moodle for this. This courses are all de delivered in Moodle and they will highlight any challenges in assignment completion, any common area errors, areas of need. Um, and, and we will often make edits, you know, live edits to courses because of, you know, something that is pr proving a challenge in an assignment um, or, you know, or improvement. So we're we're continually um, acting on this feedback or we're we're taking it on board for a future review of the course. It's a very resource heavy way to do things, but we find that the, the data we get is really invaluable and it's important to act on it. Then in our impact survey and our course, which is our, our eight week, you know, following return to classroom follow up, we did that really results in a deeper review because I suppose one of our our main goals in all of these courses is to facilitate the embedding of digital learning in the classroom. And, and that's why this impact piece is so important for us. So so that, you know, a lot of that 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 feedback we would act on um, around, you know, well, how can we make it easier for teachers to actually bring it back to their classroom? And we will do things like we, you know, we've provided PowerPoint presentations to teachers that they can share with their colleagues, but they're really easy to get through in a staff meeting. So a teacher that may not have um, great confidence about presenting to their colleagues, we would we provide a very short presentation with with video content and that doesn't require much facilitation or we would give them other resources and tips on, on what to share with colleagues. So that that's a very important uh, piece of our work and very important data emanating from that. So I suppose where where do we want to go with with all of this and um, you know, we're I suppose we're continually improving our courses and using the data to continue, you know, to continue to improve courses and our models. Um, we are looking at achieving and um, trying to achieve higher participation in the follow on impact because that that is our goal really is measuring the impact of our courses and, and facilitating the impact in, in classrooms. So we are looking at ways to uh, to achieve that. We're also really trying to encourage the sharing of learning with colleagues, which we we survey teachers on it. And I think our last survey said, you know, where where we asked, have you shared formally with colleagues? And I think 14 percent of teachers said they had shared formally in a staff meeting. But 68 percent, I think, said they they had shared informally. So we're we're trying to really support teachers in sharing and, and trying to promote um, you know, to give them that that confidence to actually share with colleagues in the staff room as well as with, you know, informally with colleagues. So that's something that's important to us. We're also looking at other data and, and particularly things like completion patterns. Um, we're, you know, we're trying to, you know, we're considering as well, what are the motivators for people to do courses and how can we tap into that? Um, and then, you know, I suppose we're always looking at, well, what other data are we gathering that could be used? Um, to improve our services. And, and again, you know, that and, and that's it is, you know, the eternal question is what 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 else do we need to know? And is there other data we should be gathering? And um, I suppose our biggest challenge really then finally would be, you know, how we use this data. And I, you know, I often feel we, we have so much of it. We have, you know, we have teachers sharing fantastic uses of digital learning in classrooms. 
and it is hard to keep on top of it. It is hard to actually um, pick out the, the you know, what we can use and, and reuse it and report back on it and, uh, and and use it to improve our services. So I suppose it, it can become, sometimes it can become a little bit overwhelming looking at how much data we're actually gathering and uh, and what we can do with it. So um, so they, that would be one of the main challenges. And and that's really it. That's that's um, that is how we use our uh, use data in those courses. Um, it, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to take them. I don't know how I'm doing on time. And um, Benjamin, if uh, you you're doing very well on time. On. Oh, am I? OK. Yes. No, you're so doing very well. So happy to take all good, any all good. questions. Yeah. Uh, well, many, many thanks, Madeleine. Uh, I think some really interesting points raised there. Um, yeah, any questions uh, from the audience? There haven't been any questions in the chat. I, I do have one or two questions myself, but it uh, would be nice to see if there are some colleagues who want to raise some questions. Effie, great, thanks. You have a question again. Effie, um, do feel free to uh, use your microphone to ask directly. Yes, hi Madeline, and many thanks for your presentation. Um, well, it's uh, definitely useful to to see how you can uh, implement it in practice through through this project. Uh, I have a question, and maybe you have an answer based on your experience and the data you collected in this uh, course. Uh, so, usually, learning analytics algorithms and the surveys we usually provide in our courses in general uh, ask questions related to race or gender or socioeconomic status and language, uh, which uh, this, these elements can somehow influence um, the results uh, that we receive. Um, that means that teachers may be evaluated based on factors that are beyond their control, right? Uh, so I'm just wondering, and I'm, I'm not sure if you can provide an answer, I'm just raising it as a topic because it's a controversial issue. Um, how could learning analytics be used effectively in teacher training with this parameter in mind? Yeah, it's a, re it's a really good question. I, I can only say in, in our case, we don't um, gather any of that data. Um, but it's a really interesting question. We 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 literally it, it, we um, gather the teacher name and their school name. So in terms of personal data, we gather very very little. Um, and I suppose it is and it, it is the it, it's the big question in relation to to um, to the learning analytics as well is how far do you know how far do you go and how you know and I mean I suppose my take on it as well is that you know we need to gather what what is relevant to us we we don't get into personal data we're more interested in i suppose uh talking about how they're you know they're applying their learning in their classroom or, or their you know their context as opposed to their personal data but i don't know maybe somebody else has more experience of of gathering that data i i, I did actually have a a question that goes in a similar direction mm. because you talked about that you have so much data mm. um and and that sometimes be difficult and overwhelming to use but i think one of the key challenges that from i found from our side is yes we also have a lot of data but uh, a lot of that is is we we can't link that to the individual um so it's sort of general mm. data but in order for us to be able to provide a more personalized experience um we in a way need that more personal data and that of course then raises a lot of other concerns and issues one of them which which uh, which uh, Effie Effie raised um so yeah uh, my my question was actually what data do you have but you you've mm. answered that um so mm. yeah um and i see Ono wants to come in on this Ono yes please uh yes um the, the, yeah, the topic of agenda and such, uh, social economic status is also researched in our project where my colleague is researching and um, he's doing his work on and uh, it's a topic which is not well covered in the research and uh, we're now trying to understand it a little bit more and um, first of all the, the first step of my colleague is to identify if there are any biases at all uh, between, for example, um, male or female uh, uh, students who work on physics tasks in, in school. And then if you see the biases, uh, how are the biases in the AI uh, integrated in AI algorithms? For example, we use a natural language processing model, which assesses pretext input of the students automatically. And then you could have bias in this learning analytics algorithm. Uh, for example, that the algorithm can learn that can say, for example, if the answer is long, 
it's wrong because uh, most of the answers which are short are correct. And uh, these are some kind of biases which the algorithm can learn, uh, unintendedly learn. And the challenge is here the feature engineering part. How can we, how can we um, distinct those things from the real topic? How can we just, uh, uh, um, yeah, how can we um, improve these algorithms? So it's a new field which is now researched on. Um, I have one paper posted in the chat. The other one is not published now, but will be. Uh, but if you follow Adrian Grimm, he will, yeah, he will uh, uh, also respond and um, yeah, can give you more information on this. Many thanks, Ono. And that kind of um, understanding and uh, of, of algorithmic bias um, is is so important now with uh, all these AI tools popping up. Um, so yeah, also in this context, of course, very relevant. Great. Um, are there any other questions or comments from anyone in the chat or well, please, you can also raise your hand for Madeline. Anything that maybe resonates with your own practices. Um, most of you are teacher trainers in some formal way. Um, anything that resonates, anything that you do differently? Uh, yes, Julian, let me just give you uh, permission. Can Julian, I speak you now? Should... Can you yes, hear me? Yes, you have. Yes, we can hear you well. OK, thanks. My name is Julian Stanley. I work for the European Training Foundation. Um, really interested, Madeline, you know, really impressed at what you're doing. Um, I mean, if I've understood correctly, you're not using the data analytics to inform the, the learning experience that individuals are getting in the course of their training. Rather, you're using it perhaps in what might call the traditional manner mm -hmm. to, to generate evidence to evaluate the overall course and therefore to feed into future design or, 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 or to training of your trainers. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So what I'm wondering is why not? <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, on the face of it, you're using data to make work a little bit, bit better. Mm. The kind of stuff that teacher tra the teacher trainers have always been doing. Mm. You know, I mean, they've always been doing post training surveys mm -hmm. uh, when they've been good. They've done a follow up or when they <laughs> you know what I mean, and, you, yeah. and you're kind of automating that a bit. Mm. So I kind of I'm just curious because not not in any way to be critical, but because mm. I'm trying to understand how teacher trainers over time gain confidence and know how to make use of data analytics. What the sort of first stage mm. is, what the second stage is, you see what I mean? Yes. Um, You've kind of dipped into it, mm. but but are the reasons why you're not seeking to use mm. the data which is generated or could be generated and captured mm. and, and analyzed during the course of the training itself in, in order to improve the, the learning and teaching experience, the learning and training experience? I mean, is that a conscious decision you've made or is that mm. just where you've got to? Is that something you're planning to do? Uh, yeah. I suppose it's it's a combination maybe of all of those and I, I one of the things that we would um you know we focus our our I suppose our online offerings are a part of an overall package for digital learning in schools and we uh we would do some work of you know evaluating uh implementation of digital learning in schools so there's kind of a bigger picture so online learning would be just part of um part of what we offer to schools in terms of uh support we would go into schools um and then the the you know implementing learning at a whole school level would be another area that we work on. Yeah. So I suppose it's something that we would probably, you know, look at doing, but we don't, uh, you know, our, I, the way we use our data at the moment is very much, as you say, it is into just improving our services, improving impact in the classroom, but not looking so much at the individual and looking more at the, you know, the, the overall piece. Um, so yeah, so it is something we will probably look at developing in the future. But at at the moment, because it's it's one of many projects that we deliver to schools, it's probably not a priority area right now. But it, it is probably it is something that we are definitely going to be looking at. And particularly, we're doing some work with AI even in schools, 
So we are looking at, you know, the connection between, well, if we're we're talking to teachers about AI in schools and, and gathering data and and all of that, that actually there is a piece there in relation to uh, to um, upskilling teachers in this area as well. And how do we build that into our program? So I suppose we're always learning and uh, we're always mm -hmm. looking at it, at improving what we do. But um, I don't know if that answers your question, Julian, but it's just a. No, uh, thanks. Thank yeah. you very much. I mean, yeah. just because something can be done, it doesn't yes. mean to say now's the moment to do it. Yes. You know, I yeah. mean, it, so thank you. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks for the question, Julian, and thanks very much, Madeline, uh, for your input there and for giving us the, the perspective of the practices you implement in Ireland. Uh, we do need to move on now to the uh, second presentation um, from Honor Karadimir. Um, let me just quickly share the uh, share his. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, Onur Karadimir is a research assistant um, at the Leibniz Institute for International Educational Research. So, um, working together with uh, Professor Draxler, in fact, and uh, Onur is currently um, writing his PhD on learning analytics dashboards for school teachers. And during his studies, he's also founded a startup called StudyCore, which provides edtech tools to schools and universities with a focus on adaptive learning and learning learning analytics dashboards. And as part of uh, the work um, uh, as, as, as a researcher and as the founder of StudyCore, uh, Honor, I believe you also offer teacher trainings um, on the topic of learning analytics, encouraging teachers to use learning analytics in their classrooms. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from you uh, about that. Um, yeah, over to you, floor is yours. Great, uh, thanks for the intro, Benjamin, and thanks for having me here. Um, uh, Sorry, Honor, just to quickly say, I don't see you anymore. I don't see your, ah, now you're back. Okay, great. I'm here? That's, okay, yeah, great. Excellent. <laughs> Nice. Um, so Benjamin, are you? Uh, can I control it, or is it that? Störung anfordern. Okay. Yeah. Now I can, I guess, control it. Slides, right? Let me check. Ah, okay. Now it works. All right. Um, yeah. Hi everyone. Um, today I want to talk about how. We applied learning analytics in classrooms um, in, in the context of my PhD project and um, how we train teachers in order to apply learning analytics in, pra in teaching practice and um, how we have an approach uh, which is which can be called like learning by doing. And um, first of all, and let me try to get to the next slide. That's lagging a bit. Um, let me check. The remote control is somehow lagging. OK, now it's working. Uh, yeah, this is short information about me, but Benjamin introduced um, uh, yeah, my persona quite well. Um, I'm doing my PhD in learning analytics dashboards, uh, found a st uh, startup which is called StudyCore. And my interests are learning analytics dashboards and feedback and ed tech integrated into higher school, higher education and uh, into schools. Um, so the main question we have here is how can we support teachers to make effective use of learning analytics? And uh, the context of uh, on which we apply this question is our research project, which is called learning progression analytics, where we apply learning analytics in schools. And um, yeah, our approach is to, yeah, first of all, sorry, so, yeah, first of all, um, the concept we, yeah, we present in, uh, present in my PhD is that we provide teachers a dashboard where they can also make interventions. So you, so you can uh, think about it, uh, the class as a train and you try to uh, as a, uh, ride the train and you try to control somehow what you can control in the train and uh, the dashboard would be then those elements where you can see how fast the train is going for example or where there's some problems or not and uh, the the other part is the feedback part where you can steer the the the, the cockpit and steer the train into uh, uh, yeah into a uh, the direction you wish to go 
So this is the concept we want to apply into the learning analytics dashboard. And uh, the way we, um, yeah, we applied this in the school is mainly about um, in these those three steps. Um, so, so it's first of all it's co-design. Then we have integrating the learning analytics in the, into the classroom, and the third step is the evaluation and see how teachers use the dashboard and uh, drive, um, yeah results from this and uh, conclusions from the evaluation. Um, first of all, in the co-design process, we. Sorry for this uh, scrolling problem, but I hope you still can read it uh, for the co-design process. So, yeah, we interviewed. Uh, oh no, is, it, is it easier if I move the slides for you? Yeah, I hope it's easier. Yeah. I think it's easier. Sorry, Sorry for this. <laughs> No, no problem. So you just have to let me know when I need to move on. Mm -hmm. OK, so you can go directly to the next slide. So we made co-design interviews with, uh, with STEM teachers because the learning analytics dashboard should be integrated into uh, STEM classes on physics classes. And we asked teachers, OK, what are your challenges regarding learning analytics and what are your challenges regarding uh, feedback? How uh, what are your problems regarding giving feedback to students and then we had uh, we designed a mock-up with this with Miro with sketching tool uh, how a dashboard should look like and how a feedback system should look like based on this and uh, we collected requirements and um, had some suggestions after that uh, in the next slide uh, you can see the final product uh, product is not uh, never it's, it's, it's uh, product is not, it's, um, yeah, you cannot find a product, but it's, it's a product we can deliver. Uh, is then the dashboard we will apply it to to the um, to the teachers and to those classes. And for example, you can see here how the performance of the students are distributed uh, uh, in 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 four different performance quartiles, or how the students performed in a different task. And you can see if you hover, for example, on a on a on a part of the dashboard, you see what exact uh, knowledge elements uh, the students brought into this answer uh, into the task. And you can directly see, OK, this topic was not understood quite well or this concept wasn't well understood and can make interventions based on this. Um, in the next slide, you see a different view. For example, here you can see how students um, yeah, performed in different learning goals. Uh, this is now about uh, energy learning and it's electric energy, radiant energy and energy transformation, for example. Um, it's in German, so that's why it's, uh, it's all in German, but the concept is that we have different learning goals and that we see uh, that we visualize on which level the different students are. And we can also see on the visualization on the down on the second part uh, that you see also the distribution of every student in the different topics. And, um, and the next part, so this is the, the, the prototype we developed, and the next part would be then the teacher training. How can we integrate this into the classroom? So the teachers will deploy a learning unit uh, about energy into their physics lessons. It's about six weeks uh, in their curriculum, and before the unit, we train them how to use the dashboard. So I show them what I showed you, and um, I show them how they can get insights into the students' learning and how they can give feedback. And this is by uh, showing them some examples. Um, I don't give them real data because of data, uh, yeah, data protection issues, but I give them realistic data, we, which we changed from previous uh, collections. Uh, we permutated a little bit and showed them realistic data. Uh, where they can make decisions on and train on how to give feedback based on these situations. Um, in the next slide, you can see, for example, a situation. Yeah, for example, you see that the student uh, learner 268 uh, is not well performing in energy transformation in this topic. So if you click on them, you can give them feedback. We, uh, we developed the system that way that you can generate the feedback semi-automatically so you see those uh, feedbacks uh, which are generated via rules uh, automatically 
and the teachers can then adapt those feedbacks. For example, we, we provide them a, a template, what went well, what went not so well, and what would I recommend you to do next? And we, yeah, we discuss this and see, okay, does it, that is, does it make sense to use this at all? Does it make sense to send them those feedbacks or is it obsolete? And um, we go to different conclusions, but it helps teachers to, um, yeah, we help them to use the tool by, uh, by doing so. And um, in, the, in the next slide, for example, you can, this is the individual feedback in the next slide, you can, for example, say, you don't have so much time and you collect the whole group of students. For example, you see that eight students are struggling on the topic of electric energy. You, collect, uh, you select them and then you can also send them feedback. And um, we try to automate, not automize, but give them a lot of uh, help with the template, for example, what was good, what was not so good, and also with the text, uh, feedback text. But the uh, teachers still have to give those feedbacks to the, teacher, to the students and write those feedbacks. And um, by that, we trained them or we showed them how, how it works. And in the next slide, um, you can see when the teachers send the feedback to the students, the students will then get it in their Moodle environment. They will get a, a Moodle message and the students can also respond to this, to this feedback. So we have feedback as a dialogue. And uh, also, for example, uh, some teachers suggested to ask the students directly what's the problem and then see what's uh, and, and get students to tell us what the problem really is, not only suggesting what it could be. And um, so this is one feature of this whole system. And we want to see, OK, does it make sense to use this in this, in this classroom? Does it make sense? Does it give uh, teachers a better feeling of teaching? Uh, give them, does it give them a better, does it improve the teaching quality? And most of all, does it improve the learning quality? Does it improve uh, the students' learning? And this is why the third step is important uh, in the next slide. Um, another slide. <laughs> so we talked about uh, yes. So we talked about integration in the in the classroom. We trained them before, and then during the units we do biweekly. So every two weeks, dashboard sessions uh, after each lesson. And uh, the dashboard is displaying real situations, so it's not mocked up or so something. It's the real situation of the of the current course, how the students are doing. And then we uh, today we had the first interview, and then we do this session and see, okay, where can we see, where can we detect problems in students' learning, and how can we give feedback to the students? And there were some situations today. They told us, okay, I don't know what to do. It uh, doesn't make sense. But there were also different visualizations uh, where they said, ah, okay, this is helpful. I can give them feedback on their task and I can give feedback, for example, to five students in the same time. So this is then important for us to know, okay, we should use this feature and not that feature and eliminate unuseful features. And so this is what we are currently doing during the unit. And after the unit, we want to do an evaluation after six weeks of usage. We want to evaluate this tool and see uh, what effects it has uh, to the learning. Uh, in the next slide, you can see yeah, this is the first step now, and this is now more about research on um, actionability of teacher dashboards or dashboards uh, per se. For example, this is um, and this is a good example for dashboards. For a dashboard on the right side, if you see, for example, that the, the um, for example, you, you see that you have problems with your weight, for example, and you see it, but you don't know what to do next. So some most dashboards are uh, displaying data, so you are aware of this data, but it's hard to some, for some teachers or for a lot of people to interpret the dashboard, to self-reflect and to make sense of the data. And at the end of the day, to impact, so to, to give feedback or to do something, to make an intervention based on what you saw. And uh, this is then the research gap we have. Uh, I want to focus on the impact part. How can I make impact after seeing a problem? So that's why we want to make an evaluation. Um, so some questions which are, uh, which are interesting, for example, what are the barriers for the teacher dashboard in school practice? 
uh, I can imagine that the te teachers can say, okay, this is cool, this is nice research, but I have no time to use this, uh, or I would use it, but I need this and this and that. Um, what is the possible effect on teaching? So does it improve uh, teachers' interventions? Does it improve uh, the lesson planning of the teachers? And uh, what does the feedback uh, look like? The feedback the students, uh, the teachers send from the dashboard. Also interesting part. And the most interesting part, does it help students to learn? So what are their learning outcomes to, uh, for the students who got the feedback versus the students who got no feedback? And uh, this is also what we could also do is we could look at the usage data of the teachers and then analyze, okay, how uh, and understand which features are most important and understand um, how we could redesign the dashboard to make it um, to make it less uh, busy, less full, to make it simpler, to make it cleaner and nicer and look at the usage data of the teachers by doing so. Um, so these are some examples, some questions and yeah, thank you for your for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, just let me know. And yeah, I'm happy for your, uh, to hear from your feedback. Many thanks, Honor. Um, yeah, no, really interesting to hear there. Um, this uh, quite specific uh, case of uh, you developing a dashboard and then training teachers uh, on the use of that dashboard and also the process of involving teachers in the in the process of developing that dashboard, that co-design element, which was such a key element um, uh, highlighted by Professor Draxler yesterday, really. Uh, involving from the start the stakeholders, uh, involving them in the design, etc., um, and then making sure that the, the the use of these dashboards and the useful analytics takes a pedagogical focus rather than a sort of yeah technical focus. Um, are there any questions, comments from <coughs> any of the participants? Feel free to raise your hand. I see Antoine. Yes, please. Um, go ahead. Antoine, you should have a right to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Still can't hear you, Antoine. Well, if the mic doesn't work, then um, maybe you can write your question into the chat. OK, well, well while we wait for um, Antoine to write his question in the chat or still to sort out his microphone, um, I, I have a quick question. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, when you do these type of trainings, um, what are sort of typical questions that you get um, from from teachers? Um, what are their concerns um, that you maybe you didn't originally think about, um, but then throughout the process of the trainings, um, really, yeah, were, were were highlighted to you? Is there anything that you could uh, flag mm -hmm. up there? Um, yeah, first of all, teachers have different levels of digital competencies and. Uh, some teachers are really uh, understanding everything in the first at first sight when you when they're looking at the dashboard or some teachers need a little bit more training so teachers are diverse and it's um yeah we should consider that some people need an extra uh, session where session where you help them uh, versus some teachers they are starting to write the feedbacks and understanding everything and clicking on every button without uh, being frightened so there are different competencies in the teacher's uh, level and um, the, the concrete uh, use case driven view, which we researchers most times don't have. Uh, this is important because uh, if you talk to the teachers to say, OK, I need the direct link from this uh, number or this visualization to what the students really did. And uh, sometimes we have a lot of ideas, but if you go to the practice, uh, it's there is always something you didn't consider, so you have to test in practice. You you won't consider consider this in theory. Uh, what 
the best tool would be. So, um, yeah, they came, some ideas came out just after testing it. And I think this will always be because you don't cannot come with every idea which is useful from your own. OK, great. Um, yeah, and the diversity of teachers, definitely something I think everybody involved in teacher training is very aware of and a key challenge, of course, but uh, also makes it very interesting. Uh, Antoine has raised his hand again, so I'm not sure, Antoine, if you want to try again now. <laughs> um, OK, sorry, everything froze. My team's crashed. So now you are ready or otherwise we're going to have to move on. Uh, your mic should you should have. No, you should be able to use your mic on one. Uh, well, um, we have a question in the meantime here from Federico in the chat. Um, if teachers have different levels of competencies, are you using these dashboards also with the teachers to improve their teaching practice? Um, or any quick thoughts on that? This is the research the other colleague of, uh, of us does. Uh, she's looking at the teaching competences of the teachers and how it affects them. And um, uh, using this dashboard also to improve that. Yeah, this is what we asked them. We asked them, do you think that this dashboard will improve your digital skills or teaching, uh, digital teaching skills? And some of them say yes, some of them say I don't know. And most of the time it's the people who are not um, so open-minded to the tool, they say no, and the people who are open to the tool and like it, they say, okay, it would improve my teaching and also my teaching skills. But this is still an ongoing research which we do in this project. Okay, um, we have a couple of questions, more questions uh, coming in now. Um, uh, maybe we can come back to those questions at the end if we still have enough time, um, because I do want to move now to our third guest speaker, Rui Pacheco. So thanks again, Honor, for your input there and sharing your experiences. Um, maybe we can pick up some further questions at the end directed at you. So yeah, thanks again. And now it's my pleasure to um, welcome uh, Rui Pacheco. Um, Rui is the director of the multimedia division of Porto Editora which is the leading um, publisher group in Portugal and provider of Escola Virtual, which is a virtual learning environment used by 80% of Portuguese teachers, school teachers, and over 350,000 students. So really wide distribution there. Um, and as part of the provision of this environment, of course, uh, Porto Editor also runs teacher trainings. And uh, I'm really curious to hear from Roy more about how they make use of the data they gather from their platform for the purposes uh, of the teacher training that they offer. So uh, pleasure to have you here, Roy. Um, and yeah, Hi. Floor, I'm going over to, to you. Put the control. I guess I can share the presentation. Yeah. Yes, you should be able to share. Uh, I hope everyone is seeing the the presentation now. So yes, we can what, see it now. So what what uh, I'm going I'm going to to share with you is uh, at first uh, a little a little context about uh, what we do and why we do teacher training, and then try to move uh, as fast as I can into the real thing. So getting getting the just a general idea of what we are, besides what has been already said. Uh, we are a publisher that that uh, became a solution provider because of the the deeds of the of the schools, um, and uh, we are present in uh, a lot of different uh, Portuguese speaking countries, and we are, and we are a very old company for any any uh, for, for um, any uh, kind of uh, analysis you can get. So we do. Uh, a lot of things, but these are the ones uh, I, I wish to point out because we are textbooks publisher and a lot of other books about 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 um, education and exercises and so on. But uh, teacher training becomes a part of what we do with our platform, and uh, that is why we invest a lot in the, in this part uh, of, of the business. Escola uh, Virtual, as as uh, it was it was said before, is our platform, one of our platforms. 
And uh, what we are addressing is students by themselves, teachers, and of course, institutions, let's say schools, uh, uh, regional governments, the central government, uh, and, and some municipalities, because they, they uh, license our platform for their students and their teachers to work all together. Um, Escola Virtual is, is a very uh, large, uh, has a very large database of educational resources. Uh, this wouldn't be uh, um, uh, something to, to underline if the, every single of those uh, resources or almost all weren't connected to metadata that uh, states which learning goal uh, it was created for. And we are talking about not only the, the, the resources for um, teaching purposes or self-learning purposes, but also uh, all the, the, the exercises, all the assessment items are tagged uh, with metadata. So we try to go through any national curriculum program, try to identify uh, the, the learning goals, and then we tag every single resource we, we, we produced according to that, and we try to do it as granular as, as we can do it. So every single uh, subject uh, slash uh, year uh, has 100, 150 uh, um, uh, learning goals and every single uh, resource that is produced either for, for teachers, uh, um, te teaching purposes or for evaluation purposes has that metadata attached. And that is why the, 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 the data we collect becomes even more powerful. And I'll explain you that in a moment. Of course, we do a lot of uh, gamification uh, within our platform, and that creates more data because even within games and the uh, and, uh, gamified um, activities we, we produced, we try to tag everything according to the same learning goals in order to, to, to have a consistent uh, uh, approach to, to, to what we do afterwards with, uh, with that data. Uh, one of the things that uh, was mentioned before is that uh, it's really challenging to produce the dashboards that can somehow be interpreted by, by the, the, the students, by the teachers, and in our case, even, even by direct, uh, directors, by municipality uh, um, people, and, and, for, and by the, the, the parents of, of the students that use our, our system. So, um, at, at, at this time, we gather much more information than, to one, that, than the one we, we can provide to them because it, uh, the main difficulty is trying to create ways that are, are easily understood uh, uh, by, by, by parents, by students, and we create a lot of different uh, dashboards for them, but, uh, but it's something that we, we, we find very challenging, uh, mainly because one other thing that was said before, that is we have very different levels of, of technology and awareness and uh, that creates a lot of uh, uh, problems to, to be understood. Uh, some of those uh, of those feedbacks are, are going like this. So we have a, a, a color language about things being done, things being achieved, things being in, in the process. And that is given for teachers, that is given for every single student, that is given for every single parent. And uh, also we, we anonymize this kind of data when we are talking about municipalities and so on, uh, everything according to, 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 the, to the laws of, of personal data information. Uh, coming back in, in, into the, the, real, the real theme of, of, of this conversation, uh, we do training uh, most most of the time because our textbooks are chosen by 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 teachers and therefore for us the textbook is never a textbook uh, by itself it's a large um, uh, constellation of of uh, functionalities and content that goes into to the, the the same purpose which is to help teachers teach and to help students learn and therefore we we train teachers into using our own textbooks uh, so that is a part of the of the of the, of the reason why why we we work in this field the other part is that we are we are in the process at least in portugal we are in the process of, of uh, having large scale programs of digitalization even if the, the this this uh, this word is not really uh, translates what it should be happening but nevertheless you, you get the idea the the thing is uh, we have a lot of um, 
schools going 100% digital and they need to, to, to be helped in that process. And uh, we do a lot of things in that process. We train trainers, we train teachers, we, we, uh, we develop the projects with the governments. We try to do a, a lot of things in order to, to create a consistency of the whole process. And uh, uh, just for, for uh, the, so as an example, we have large scale uh, state um, owned projects that uh, are going to become al almost the, the majority of, of the population. Uh, by 25, 26, uh, they will have uh, no textbooks and they will do most of their uh, work with, within platforms and with digital versions of textbooks and so on. Uh, so it, this that is why it's really important to train people to to gather that and to to know how about to use that data in a proper way. Uh, this uh, we do train either on a one to one basis because we have around one hundred and fifty consultants that visit schools uh, very often. So. Uh, by studying the, the the profiles of each teacher in each school, we can work somehow uh, in in a way that to personalize the approach to that to that teacher. So we we create our our team of um, uh, data analysts that that are together in a, in a new department we have from five years ago, or something like that. Uh, they they build uh, with uh, with Microsoft Power BI. Uh, a lot of dashboards that uh, uh, allows our training people and our consultants to uh, analyze what teachers are really using, what their struggles might be, and create uh, an, the opportunity either to one on one or in groups to to try to help teachers uh, with what we, they do. So, of course, when we are working with lunch groups of people is very hard to 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 do that uh, that's there's no there's no way to personalize but uh, we do the the this kind of approach for teachers but we also do it for students and for parents uh, we also do it online because we have uh, another project that is called academia uh, that that uh, we created a lot of uh, online courses for teachers we started with general general courses for technology and teaching how to 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 use their voices uh, addressing special special needs uh, assessments and now we are moving into much more detailed uh, approaches on on teaching within each subject within each uh, um, uh, group of, of of years and so on so we are, we are getting deeper and deeper and we do that uh, as it was mentioned before by analyzing what what the feedback is after the the, the completion of the, of the courses but we also gather data from the same teachers that use our platform school virtual for teaching purposes and we we can create a more a much more exact image of what the teacher really knows and what their difficulties might be and create within our, our platform also courses that address those 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 needs so we we are we we have a we have a very clear uh, idea of what the teachers need need because we uh, either one on one or after the, the completion of the courses or with the data the data we gather from their usage within our platform uh, what we do with with learning analytics, as I mentioned, we use Power BI uh, to get a, a much more um, worked idea of uh, the the information we have. Because the, one of the challenging challenges of uh, of the of having a lot of data, and we have around two or three million uh, user sessions per per month, uh, and that creates. 30 50 million data points to to analyze so it will be impossible to to do that uh, without uh, this kind of dashboards and without uh, uh, specific people working around that data um, so what we do is trying to create uh, 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 pictures of of, of uh, what uh, a school is is going through what uh, a group of teachers within a subject is going through and of course what is happening with every single teacher and with every single student? But for this for this presentation, there is the teacher part that is is really important. So 
we we can uh, in, do a lot of infer do a lot of inferences through this kind of uh, of usage, and also we try to address more and more uh, what happens in the interaction between the teachers and students. For instance, if a teacher gives a, a tasks a task to a student regarding maths, we try to follow what the student does and how he performs, and if he performs well, we might suggest to other teachers that he might use that resources for a, a student with a with a similar uh, difficulty, and we also do this uh, automatically. So the, the the data we gather not only serves to to inform teachers about their students' needs and and uh, try to to complement their their uh, their um, their idea of, about what needs to be done and how do those needs need to be, to be addressed but we also as we are working with adaptive uh, approaches since 2013 we also automate a lot of these um, learning paths um, suggestions to to students by the, when they study by themselves so this works both ways uh we also do when we are talking about about um, uh, not only uh, online uh, teaching but uh, uh, doing doing the training inside the, the school because that is a really important uh, thing to do in Portugal because most of the time teachers teachers uh, kind of uh, uh, are afraid of technology because things tend to fail a lot. Uh, so we try to go to their schools, use their computers, their networks in order to show them that it is possible to, to do. And we 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 uh, adapt the, the training to their real needs. And of course, uh, as I was mentioning before, we do that together with the analysis of, of, of the data uh, they, they, they allow us to collect within the, the usage uh, of day to day uh, basis um, in Scala Virtual. So we can do a lot of uh, customization, even one to one, as I, as I said, and we do it, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in order to 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 try to not not to not to say something general to everyone when there are people with very different levels of understanding and very different levels of, of, of technology awareness. Uh, so this is and roughly uh, what, what we do. I might uh, answer a few questions about this in a, in a moment, but uh, this is uh, this is something very complex uh, explained in, the, in the much in the, the easiest way I can do it. I hope I, I achieve it. Thank you very much. Yes, Rui, many, many thanks for that. Uh, very impressive um, to see this type of a uh, very comprehensive use of data use and that impacting or being implemented. Oh, sorry, I'm getting sound from a Portuguese video. Would you mind okay, going okay. to another slide or? I can, I can just stop this. OK. Yeah. OK, thanks. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so 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 um, yeah, uh, very impressive and and very comprehensive uh, in the way data is being used there uh, to to feed into and to facilitate the teacher training processes. Um, I, I'm sure this raises uh, many questions. Um, I, I definitely have a couple myself, um, but uh, let's maybe first open the floor to um, to other colleagues here attending the webinar. Any thoughts? Any questions? Um, anyone I see here there's a comment from Eric um, probably not directed at you but uh, 2026 no textbooks is Portugal still on track do other European countries have the same goal um, personally I couldn't say but uh, I don't know really maybe you have a I, 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 I didn't quite understand the, the question sorry uh, first I think question is if it if Portugal is actually still on track to to get rid of all textbooks by 2026 and uh, if if other countries are having the same type of goal. <laughs> um, uh, well, uh, what I can tell you is that no one is trying to get rid of uh, textbooks. Uh, we are trying to somehow transform what textbooks do into something, of course, different to, uh, for, for the purpose of, of this uh, transition. We still call, it, call them textbooks, but uh, well, there are different breed of uh, educational resources, but uh, uh, just just like calling an ebook uh, a version of a book, uh, so it's just a question of uh, trying to make things and understandable for for the ones that are not into technology. So we call the 
almost the same thing to different stuff, but uh, no one is getting try is trying to get rid of the textbook. Okay, and um, there is a there's another question now in the chat by uh, Sava. Sava, feel free to also raise your hand if you want to maybe elaborate. Um, otherwise, I can quickly relay it to Rui. Um, so Sava asks, how do you measure teachers' motivation to participate? Well, uh, teacher motivation to participate is is uh, is uh, easily measured because we we. we um, deliver a lot of sessions and uh, of course there are very different levels of, of, of participation and we can uh, exactly know where are, there are difficulties where we, we need to go one-on-one -on -one. so we have a very clear picture of uh, oh, it's what is happening by seeing uh, for instance if, if uh, we have we have 20 of, of 50 uh, teachers in within a school uh, with a digital project to be being implemented and only 10 10 percent goes to to the training session that means that we need to to address the the the, the issue differently because most of most of times it's not a question a question of of motivation it's just that teachers do not want to be exposed by by what they do not know uh, and probably this is very common or everywhere. So they don't. They, the the ones that that uh, probably have the less uh, information about this these technologies, about these uh, pedagogical approaches, uh, are the ones that probably keep uh, keep keep themselves uh, uh, out of this because they don't want to show uh, that uh, they don't know. So we need to address one on one in order to 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 not expose them. Uh, so. Motivation is not really uh, um, an issue, even if uh, on a broader, broader um, sense of it, we have a very difficult problem in Portugal with teachers because there's a lot of uh, other things besides technology and pedag pedagogical, uh, pedagogical issues that are, are, are bothering teachers and that has more to do with, with uh, the way they are, being, they are being paid and they're being treated by the central government. Many thanks. There's a, a hand raised hand. Uh, Effie, yes, please. Yes, uh, one quick uh, question from my side. I'm curious to know if um, if you received any report from a teacher uh, say reporting about feelings related to um, learning analytics impinging on their autonomy or feelings related to uh, be feeling like they are being judged for their professionalism in general. Um, have you received this type of uh, comments or have uh, teachers involved in these activities expressed um, relevant concerns? Oh, no, not not really. Most, most of the times uh, there is uh, uh, general uh, fear that uh, technology somehow is going to to substitute teachers uh, that is a a very a very uh, common issue probably for 20 years but uh, nevertheless uh, we try we try to to explain that uh, what we do is mainly to enhance what they do not really to substitute whatever and uh, regarding specific uh, learning analytics what happens is the the we are still providing much less information and much less uh, uh, treated information than to, than we we could because we feel that um, there are two problems. First, we don't want to 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 frighten people, uh, and second, we we believe that uh, their their complaints about not uh, having the the enough time to do personalization. Uh, Probably by providing them more information about each student, that will create uh, more pressure. So we do it uh, in a very, very progressive way. So until now, we don't have any complaints about about uh, they feel that they, their feelings that they are somehow being controlled. For instance, because they are, we are not their 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 bosses. Uh, we are we are seen and we are perceived as someone to, who is helping them, so they don't have that problem with us. It's interesting though, because uh, in, in, in some previous exchanges I've had, um, exactly this type of opposition was raised because there was this feeling, and it came from teacher trade unions, for example, that um, teachers were being observed in a way that they didn't 
one to be observed. And even though it wasn't being used at this that stage for being judged, the potential could be there that that data mm -hmm. could be fed to to relevant authorities or not. So, um, yeah, it's uh, that's always the trade-off. I feel if uh, you want to personalize to the extent that you've described it, which is I think can be very powerful. On the other hand, you then in order to personalize, you need to collect some data about the, <laughs> the people you want to personalize for. So. Yeah, uh, that's it. But uh, as lo as long as uh, as we comply with uh, with the regulations, as long as we keep teachers and students and parents aware of what we are doing and the purpose of what we are doing, and we do we, we do that by written form, so there is nothing implicit. So the, uh, nevertheless, the, the the regulations not allow us to do that. So everything is is informed, and uh, there is a, 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 a consent. To, to do this and for this purpose and within a time frame, so there is no problem with that, at least until now. Okay, and uh, and there's another question along sort of uh, the similar lines um, here from from Julian in in the chat. Um, maybe you can uh, take a moment to 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 answer in the chat um, because unfortunately we are running a bit out of time going a bit over schedule. So I, I would still like to um, share some of our own experiences at the level of the European Schoolnet Academy. So I'll take the next um, uh, 10, 15 minutes to do that. But uh, many thanks, Roy, for the presentation, for sharing your uh, yeah your experiences and insights um, from, from the work in Portugal on that. And um, yeah, thanks. Thanks again. I will now take back control and go on slides again. So, jump forward. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> well, um, we've we've heard now three, I think, quite different uh, examples of using data in teacher training. Um, at the level of the European School Net Academy, we. Um, uh, also, I wouldn't say very advanced in the use of data. Um, we do similar things um, that were outlined by 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 Madeleine in, in in regards to evaluation survey, but we don't, for example, go to the level that Madeleine outlined um, with sort of eight week. Uh, delay or or sort of a, 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 a much longer follow up survey. Um, but we have experimented in a couple of contexts um, with. Um, yeah, uh, a stronger element of personalization, and this this really being the the big challenge, especially if you run teacher trainings in in a MOOC format. Uh, with with these large scale formats, it's of course extremely difficult to get a degree of personalization, and that means that um, these courses are to a certain extent not so accessible. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we do always see that our courses are highly appreciated, but it's mostly appreciated and, and those who are mostly successful are those who are quite advanced. So they have a fairly high level of digital competence, they have a high level of self-regulated learning competence, and because our courses are often English, they have a high level of English competence. So for us, really, um, uh, a key question was that we wanted to address in a project that we ran um, back in 2020. How can we increase the accessibility of our MOOCs to make sure that um, we can help those learners who who could benefit and who would like to benefit from our offer, but um, don't because they, they lack the competencies to do so. So we ran this project um, called Teach Up. Uh, it was ran from 2017 to 2020. Um, and um, the, the main question that we, we raised in this uh, project was what are the conditions for increasing successfully the participation and completion in online courses for teachers? Um, so in a way, um, increasing the number of people who actually engage in the courses and then complete the courses. Uh, and what we um, did to to or what we tested in this project was a database personalized support offer to those at risk of dropout. Um, and we did this with uh, uh, around 4,000 teachers and student teachers across four courses um, in, in the given period of the project, um, covering 10 countries in total, nine in the EU and, and, and Turkey. And this project, and I think that's important to, to, to really take into account, it was a, had a really, really strict methodology. Um, so it was a randomized control trial with a test and a control group, and only the test group um, received the intervention. Um, and apart from that, there was real 
real substantial efforts being done to keep all other factors equal across those two groups, um, which means that uh, it allows us to make um, to draw conclusions here with a um, that that if this intervention actually works or not. Um, well, let me say a bit more about this intervention. Um, well, first of all, we we um, took data from the learner profiles and from their progress um, as they moved through the course platform. Uh, and then we coupled that information with a dedicated support offer, which allowed us to create what we called scalable personalized support. So it wasn't a support offer that we offered to everyone, um, that made it scalable uh, and it was personalized because it took into account um, the data that we had gathered through the profiles and the progress. In detail, that meant something like this. So learner profile data, we looked at um, their pedagogical beliefs, previous experience of online learning, professional characteristics, personal characteristics. Um, and we gathered that data through a dedicated survey. And this is uh, one of the only instances we haven't done that again to gather all this type of data, um, mainly because we can't link that data to the individual. In this, in the context of this project, we could do that. So that all the teachers who participated agreed um, to this uh, collection of uh, non-anonymous data. Um, <clears throat> and that only that then allowed us really to, um, to, 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 to move forward in the intervention. Um, so that was the type of profile data we were using. And in regards to course progress data, we were using things like um, when did they start the course or have they even started the course? Uh, the percentage of the sections they had completed in the course, uh, the timing of any submissions they had to make, this type of information. And, and we, we re really investigated the research literature to determine then which of these factors can predict a high likelihood of dropout. So very basic example, for example, if you, if you have very low experience of online learning, then the likelihood of dropout is higher than if you have a high experience of, of dropout. Um, so yeah, so, so based on that, we made a prediction of who has a high likelihood of dropout. Um, and that then allowed us to send out uh, personalized emails uh, with support only for those users who we determined to be uh, at a had a high level of dropout. So, so that's the, the scalability uh, aspect. Um, how did this work in practice? Um, well, this was a kind of setup. We had a control course, a treatment course with the same moderator, as mentioned, keeping all the factors as equal as possible. And then on the treatment course, we had dedicated uh, people who we'd call support agents who followed a very strict protocol, um, and they had access to the survey results and the course progress data. And they sent out emails to the, uh, to well, not to everyone in the treatment course, but only to those individuals who were identified as having a high likelihood of dropout. Um, so here's an example of uh, uh, an intervention that was based on the user's profile. So the data trigger here was, a uh, user has a low experience or low confidence with online courses. That led to an action from the support agent. They reached out with an email um, saying that, look, I'm available to, to help you here. Um, we can have a one-to-one -one chat um, or um, or if you want, just get back to me uh, to this email with, with some questions you might have uh, and I can help you walk through maybe some of the, the questions or concerns you have. Um, and the aim here was that, uh, of course, we were trying to make sure that we didn't lose these people and help them to 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 complete the course. Another example uh, where is where based on users' progress um, was so the data trigger here was well the user hadn't started the course even though the after five days after the course had launched. Um, the action uh, was that the again send the the support agent sends out an email with a personal reminder um, with an offer of additional support. So just saying, OK, look, uh, we've noticed you haven't uh, started the course yet. Um, if, if you're not sure, if you're uh, sort of like the confidence uh, in it, then we are here to or I'm here to support you. Um, and here are some sub additional support. Uh, um, resources. Here, the uh, the aim was to get the user even to only engage on the course. So, so before getting them to complete, we even need to get them to start on the course, and that's a, that that can be a big problem, as as we know from our experience. Now, interestingly enough, very very few of the teachers who we reached out to with these uh, support offer with these emails actually got back to us. Very few of them took up the offer. Um, I mean, really, hardly any. Um, 
But nevertheless, we did see actually quite a substantial and statistically significant impact here. So the course completion rates of teachers in EU countries increased by 10 percentage points between the control group and the treated group. So we found that, um, well, first of all, we were quite surprised by that because we had so little response from the uh, participants to the support offer, but it suggests that something was happening here that that did seem to 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 work. Uh, a slight proviso should be added that um, we did didn't see a statistically significant impact on student teachers. So this was this impact was only seen on teachers who are already working as teachers. Uh, and we didn't see a statistically significant impact on teachers from Turkey. Now, we don't know exactly why that's the case. Uh, we can make assumptions, um, um, uh, but um, but it would require it, it would have required a more in-depth investigation, which was out of the scope of the project. What we can say is potentially uh, an explanation in Turkey was that um, <clears throat> the way the course was run there by the moderator was different. Uh, there were differences to the way it was done in the EU countries. And um, there might have also been a bit of um, pollution between the two courses in some of the messages that were transferred uh, between them. So so that, that might be one of the factors that could have played into this. Other factors are that um, um, generally the, the, the uh, teachers in Turkey and then also the student teachers had less experience of online learning, which might have been also a factor that plays into this. Who knows? Difficult to say, but uh, important to note nevertheless. Now, the question is, why did this work, even though these teachers uh, never really responded to the support offer? Well, again, we can only assume here, um, but uh, we concluded that it was it must have been a mix of these four different elements. So um, on the one hand, by getting the, such an email, they might have felt a sense of control. Someone is watching over me. Somebody's noticing that I'm not uh, progressing on the course in the same way as if you are in a face to face setting, maybe in the uh, in, in, in a workshop in a, in a, a, a teacher training workshop that, you know, if you doze off or close your eyes, someone will notice and, uh, and there is that kind of oversight. Um, and then in a, in a more slightly positive framing, well, a sense of not being alone. So someone is looking out for me, but there someone is helping me in case I'm I'm struggling. And just the knowledge of that uh, motivated me to to actually start and engage and complete the course. Um, then, of course, the the the, the content of the emails. Um, there were always some tips and tricks and supporting resources identified. There could have, um, you know, there could have just been a prompt that helped the teachers to continue. Um, in the same way, um, yeah, uh, that some of the guidance materials that were provided there could have um, had an had an impact, etc. As mentioned, assumptions, but uh, this um, are the kind of dynamics that we we uh, feel uh, were taking place there. Based on this experience in this course, um, in in this project, we we came up with eleven rec recommendations, and um, well, the first recommendation was really obtain non-anonymous data about participants, which of course raises many other problems. But in order to be able to do something like this. Um, you need to have that kind of uh, uh, data. You need to be able to associate these these data pieces to the individuals on the course. Um, yeah, I won't go into more details regarding this, um, but um, uh, I, I will share in the follow up um, to this webinar the, the a couple of links from this project if you are interested in um, finding out more about it. But for us, it was a very interesting exercise to see how we can really make effective use of data uh, in our teacher training um, uh, context. Uh, and uh, while we haven't implemented anything as uh, substantive as we did in this project, we have tried to apply some of the some elements, some of these dynamics, which I was talking about here. So trying to give the sense of control or sense of not being alone um, um, throughout our courses uh, since we ran this project. Yes, um, <clears throat> that's uh, my contribution to this uh, exchange of uh, practices in regards to using data in teacher training context. Um, we don't have much time left, but uh, maybe a quick uh, check if there are any questions regarding the European School Net Academy experiences. Any thoughts, questions, or comments, also from the fellow speakers, uh, on on any of this? Don't see any questions in the chat.
and no hands are coming up. So yeah, sorry, I was that was a bit of a quick run through. Yes, Luca, absolutely. Um, in the uh, follow up email to this uh, seminar, uh, I'll make sure to to include links to the project there. Uh, well, I hope it's um, been useful for you. Um, yeah, uh, hopefully you've you've uh, ex well seen sort of different facets of of uh, the use of data in teacher training contexts. Um, I can definitely say that in the preparation um, for the seminar, um, it, it wasn't easy to 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 find practitioners. It wasn't easy to find examples. As Professor Drexler also already mentioned, there aren't so many uh, cases where um, data is used in a very comprehensive manner in teacher training context, or at least there's not much information being shared. So we hope that this um, seminar um, maybe is a starting point in the process of uh, everyone here. Uh, and I think with the hope that uh, many here, I think many here are active in the teacher training uh, context. Um, yeah, can, can share our experiences, um, can be inspired by the practices of others. And um, yeah, so final words, um, as you can see on the slide, um, uh, again here, the report, uh, a link to the report um, from Professor Hendrik Draxler, which I think covers quite a few areas also popping up today. So if you haven't checked that out, I um, highly recommend to do that. Do also um, follow up uh, the European Schoolnet Academy blog, where sometimes we, we address um, these kind of thematic issues we address in, in these thematic seminars. Um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, and finally to say also recordings from the seminar will be shared soon. Uh, it will take um, some time for my colleagues to to upload them to YouTube, but uh, we'll make sure to share them. Uh, and I'll also share a quick evaluation uh, survey with you to, to gather any feedback and to hear if you are interested to stay in touch regarding this topic here on, on data use in teacher training context. So thank you to all the participants. Thank you especially to all the speakers today, to Rui, to Honor, to Madeleine, and also to 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 um, Professor Draxler yesterday. Um, yes, um, with that, I think we can close today. And I really hope to see you at one of the future events that we will organize again. Many thanks. Bye, Benjamin. Bye, all. Bye, Rui. Many thanks for your contribution today. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.